Hello everyone, my name is Noemi Baumblatt. I'm a costume and stage designer from Berlin, working in dance, performance, theater and film. I studied theater and film design at the University of Applied Arts in Vienna and I also graduated in theater, film and media science at the University of Vienna. Now I'm going to talk about how costume is designing performance. This presentation happens to take place at the 10th anniversary of my diploma thesis in theater science. In 2010 I handed it in and since then never referred to it in any kind of context. Here you see the title translated into English. I investigate how objects participate in shaping the theatrical production and the actions of the performers through an analysis of the production The Lady in the Tutti Frutti Head by the Viennese theatre company Toxic Dreams in 2006. It was a biopic on the Brazilian singer and actress Carmen Miranda in form of a musical. The costume designer was Lena Quadrat. The objects were created by Ottmar Wagner. I joined the production as assistant of the scenographer and later conducted several interviews with all the persons involved. To analyze the interrelations between objects and humans in theater production and performing, I borrowed the actor network theory from science studies and applied parts of its methodology and terminology. In the ANT, all the factors involved in a social situation are on the same level. Thus, costumes, materials, objects, ideas, processes, and other factors are seen as just as important in creating social situations as humans. This perspective seems fruitful to help identify and highlight the various forms of participation of the costume in the production process. The actor network theory, ANT, was developed by Bruno Latour, Michel Callot, and other scholars in the context of science and technology studies in the 1980s. Technical innovations are seen as networks consisting of human and non-human actants. To understand the networks, it is essential to break them down and trace back the chains of action of the actants involved. It is an empirical method consisting in thoroughly describing relations. The question is always who was acting. And acting in this case means to make a difference and doesn't need to be connected to a conscience or intention. Now my presentation is going to be a rather essayistic collection of thoughts with the framework of the actor network theory in the background. I want to reflect on how costume design is not only an important part of performance making, but how the costume itself takes actively part in designing the performance. Some of the examples are drawn from my thesis, others from my own working practice as costume designer. 1. The record player. Costume as a bridge between performer and set. The costume, incidentally, although not part of the organic body, is to a considerable extent fused with it. Thus, it is often difficult to decide for certain human actions to what extent their performance is predetermined by the properties of the body and to what extent of the clothing. This is written by Jiri Veltruski in Man and Object in a Theatre in 1940. In The Lady in the Tutti Frutti Head, there is a scene with a larger-than-life record player in the middle of the stage. Two performers are holding its long arm, constantly moving it up and down. Another performer sits on the floor. She is pulling a rope that's wound around the axis of the record player to make it rotate. On top of it stands the main actress singing Ukiki Abayana Teng as Carmen Miranda. She says, there was a skirt I entered it. I closed the skirt. That was my dress and almost my body in the same time. I was part of this record player. So I tried to play with this record player with a rotation. I didn't play with it actively. I didn't manipulate anything. I familiarized myself within its rotating movement. The skirt out of a black opalescent textile is the record, which is being played and from which the actress sticks out singing. The record is the voice, and the voice is the human, and the record is her dress, and so on, says costume designer Lena Quadrat. The interdependency of the theatrical elements equates the interdependency on the level of meaning. In this case, the cladding of an object is also the dress of an actress. 
the boundary between human and object gets blurred and a new unit emerges. The costume has a bridge function as it interconnects the body of the performer directly to the object and its movement. In this case, the mobility of the actress's lower body is reduced to the record player's turning. She became part of the object and the object became a prosthesis of her body, says the actress. Her work was to emerge with an object and to form a new body. It has its own rules, possibilities and limitations. The degree of mobility and the control of the movement are embedded in a network of which all elements are mutually generating and controlling one another. The observed actions of this object costume human system are built from feedback loops. 2. Kayak skirts. A costume object functioning as a choreographer. Again the lady. The director Yosivanunu has the image of a person breached through a kayak in a set coming partly from his childhood memories and partly from the Buster Keaton classic The Balloonetic. Keaton walks in the film with a kayak around his hips through the water. The kayak idea matches loosely to the song True to the Navy, which Cam Miranda sang in honor of the US American Navy. The vague starting point is that the three dancers are wearing the kayaks as a kind of tutu, performing a ballet-like turn. The song gives a rhythm between waltz and march. The kayaks enter the creative communication process as a raw product. As actants, they bring with them their material properties and a spectrum of meanings. When meeting the other actants, this leads to synergetic processes with mutually working selections, transformations, mutations and permutations of their elements. The inner dynamic and therefore the activity of the actant consists in its ambiguity or multiguity. The kayaks release associations and trigger interpretations that are completely independent from the content of the piece. The interplay of interpretations triggered by the object and scenic ideas is a system of circulating reference where ideas have no clear origin. Once brought into the rehearsal, the object starts to uncontrollably form alliances into all directions. The set designer Ottmar Wagner, for example, sees in the moving kayak a mixture of an UFO and a spaceship. Here you can see a sketch. He plans to install fold-out legs like on an airplane and imagines the kayaks rolling on their legs through the room. Due to a lack of time, he simplifies this version and puts a light on both ends of the kayak instead. These virtual pillars create a connection to the ground and send down light beams like a landing UFO. The three performers start practicing simple belly steps to the music. The set designer prepares the kayaks. A round hole is sawn into the bottom of the kayak for the performer's legs to come out. A carrier system of shoulder bells is constructed. A first tryout creates panic among the performers. Too heavy, even painful, impossible to dance with this weight. So adjustments on the kayaks take place. Then the performers start exploring the movement potential of the kayak, testing the relation between their own movement and the movement of the kayak combined with the ballet steps and the song. Because there was no specific mimetic purpose connected to the scene, the performers are free to follow the kinetic logic inherent in the object. It lays in the combination of form, proportion, weight distribution and the connection to the performer's body. The set designer says, everything that you can do with the object has impact on what you will do with the object. This may sound banal, but it shows the dialectic of object and action in the rehearsal process. The attachment with the shoulder bells implies a swinging movement and motivates the rotation. The bells transfer the movement of the performer to the kayak. The kayak transforms it to a motion on which the performer again have to react by movement. The shoulders and the upper body make the kayak swing the point of contact between hip and kayak becomes the brake mechanism. Another possibility is the handbrake. Moving and dancing with the kayak needs a lot of practice. The director wants the turning to be as fast as possible. In the performance, the three kayak dancers enter the stage forming a propeller around the main actress in the center. 
I turn on the lights of their kayaks and start a formation dance swinging the kayaks around the singing actress. When the singing ends, the music gets faster. The stage lines turn off, the performers start turning faster and faster around the actress. The lights of the kayaks rotate over the floor. While turning, the performers have to stay in their axis of motion, keep the distance to the audience and to the actress in the middle, and they have to prevent a collision with the other kayaks. All this requires a high attention for the space, for the other performers, and a perception of the kayak as part of their own body. One dancer says that she found the motivation for this effort in her own enthusiasm for the image she helped creating in this moment. The imagination of the optical effect on the spectators is not only important in designing the scene, but is also essential for the practical work of the performers. A whole scene was scenically, spatially and light dramaturgically choreographed by these kayak actants as part of the costume. 3. Flutter sleeves. Costume initiating movement. In the last years I worked as costume designer for several contemporary dance pieces. One of them was Ariodante by the choreographer Marie-Lena Kaiser. The rehearsal process consisted of a lot of improvisation tasks and the dancers were invited to bring in their own movement material. For the upper part of the costume of one dancer, I decided relatively early in the process. A dark blue stretchy dress tied on the body with loose flutter sleeves or cap sleeves, like rouge falling down his shoulders. The flutter sleeves emphasized the dancer's movement of his arms and shoulders. So the top invited and foregrounded certain movements because of its specific shape and its performance in motion. The flutter sleeves also influenced the choreography by accentuating every jump with a slightly shifted syncopal lifting by changing its rhythm. On an associative level, the lifting of the arms made the sleeves appear as wings. Costume can play an active role in the choreographic process in contemporary dance. It may be subtle, but it makes a difference. 4. Water shoes in the air. Changing the perception through costume. Tanzlichter was a series of site-specific dance pieces by the choreographer Carla Jordan with dancers of the Volkwang Tanz Studio, shown at the Center for International Light Art UNA. One of the pieces was staged in a light installation of Misha Kubal. You can see it on the pictures. The room was in the basement. It had rough concrete floor with uneven parts, holes and heats. The movements were supposed to be fluid and smooth, and there was only little light. Under those circumstances, dancing bare feet was not possible, but normal shoes would not have worked either. I gave the dancers water shoes. The semi-transparent synthetic layer protected their feet from the ground. With water shoes, you normally walk, swim or dive through water. Being in water makes you to a certain degree conscious of the volume of the space you're moving through. So the water shoes also help the dancers getting a different perception of the space they were moving in. A room filled with light, another sphere. The invisible air became a visible entity, not only through the light projection, but also as a reflection in the movements of the dancers through the body of air. Is it really possible to shift or to manipulate the physical way of perceiving the surrounding space through part of the costume? To enter another dimension by putting on a different type of shoes? 5. The central stimulus of fabric and movement. Hold On is a performance by choreographer Celine Belu. It looks on sexual fantasies from a female perspective using dance, voice and text. The movements of the dancers were ecstatic, wild and in other parts very soft and sensual. I will show you some pictures from the rehearsal process. In the try-ons, the dancers mainly focused on the central quality of the fabric the clothes consisted of. They cared much less than usual for color, cut or their own appearance. In dance, the movability and flexibility of the costume is always a key question, due to the body moving with and in it. What happens with the shirt after bending over and coming back straight? Do the pants withstand the stretching of the legs? Do the clothes in any way restrain the movement? Is this restraint wanted? 
and so on. What I found interesting in this case was how closely the dancers paid attention to the tactile qualities and conditions of the materials. They touched it with their hands, even felt it with their cheeks. In what I brought as possible costumes, they searched for fabric that felt pleasant on their skin and gave them a good feeling while moving with it. Viscosy, soft stretchable cotton, silk were experienced as the most pleasurable and helpful tissues by the dancers. So the tactile stimulus of the fabric helped them to evoke a physical sensuality that they needed for the performance of the piece. The fabric acted in a very subtle way as a dance partner, touching the skin of the dancers and producing physical and emotional reactions. Now I'm very much looking forward to the conference and to your remarks, questions and ideas. Thank you.